And it's interesting to hear the the opinion of a marketing expert on everything that's happening with Hollywood right now. And he believes that the future of entertainment is completely already shifting towards smaller screens, whether we like it or not. For example, TikTok, YouTube, and away from traditional Hollywood productions. What's new in filmmaking technology this week? News, reviews, education, insights, opinions, and ideas from the Cine D Newsroom with Nina Leitner and Johnny Bahiri. This is Focus Check, the weekly Cinetech podcast. Welcome to episode 20 of Cine D Focus Check, our weekly podcast. I'm here with Johnny, who is in Japan. Hi, Johnny. I don't Nino, how are you? And I already... I'm sorry about the background noisy. I'm here in a supermarket, <laughs> in a in a in a space with I can work. There's a good Wi-Fi here, but of course the downside is the the noise. So I'm sorry, guys, if my sound is so so. But there's always next. We'll time. make it work, and I guess next week you'll have a better location. Uh, I mean, John is still getting settled in Japan. He'll be there there over the summer. And uh, yeah, and we try to make the best of it. So I still have Johnny next to me here on the screen. If you see this as a video podcast, um, we try to make it work. All right, let's dive right in. There's a lot of different things we should talk about this week. So it's the summer. is a little bit less news on the gear side, I would say. But there have been a couple of very interesting developments that we should talk about. I want to start with a podcast that I listened to and that I wrote about which was called Hollywood's Big, Big Tech Problem. This is from a podcast called The Town by Matthew Baloney, and he interviewed um, Scott Galloway, a professor of marketing at NYU Stern, who's very famous as well because he also has a couple of podcasts. I think he has the Prof G show and a show called Pivot uh, with Kara Swisher where, we, where they talk about tech news and stuff. And it's interesting to hear the the opinion of a marketing expert on everything that's happening with Hollywood right now, because the Hollywood bubble seems to be very, very confined and, you know, like basically occupied with themselves. We had a couple of big news from Hollywood last week as well. For example, Paramount has been taken over by a company that is run by the son of Larry Ellison, another tech big tech billionaire from Oracle. So his son took over with his company, took over, is taking over Paramount um, if the deal closes. Uh, we see a lot of big tech moving into Hollywood. We see a lot of AI companies, of course, training on Hollywood data. And what are, what are the Hollywood studios doing with that? And that's what this podcast was about. I'm just going to go through the main bullet points from that podcast you should really listen to this. It's a half hour interview and he has some very, very interesting insights from somebody who's not part of the Hollywood system. So if you haven't heard it, really go give it a listen. We'll put the link in the show notes, also the link to our article, which has the podcast embedded. But so basically, Scott Galloway was critical of the writers and actors strikes last year, saying they lacked leverage and allowed the industry to reshape itself during the strike. Well, the point being that Hollywood was at a peak peak performance when the strike started, right? Where there's never been more production in Hollywood at the same time as when the strikes actually started. We knew that we, well, everybody was talking about the fact that we're in a bubble, that the streamers are actually producing too much content in a way that is more than anybody can view. Um, there's you know, like there's this fierce competition between the streaming giants that was basically not making any money, just driving each other out of business or trying to do that. And of course, I mean, the beneficiaries of that were the creatives in Hollywood and elsewhere that were like basically everybody was working uh, in the industry, which was a first. And then the strike started because the writers and the actors uh, demanded better compensation. He argues that they took they basically made this decision to strike at the wrong time because that actually gave the um, gave the the studios an opportunity to reevaluate how much how many people do they need how much content do they need to produce and it gave them the perfect excuse to actually stop producing as much and stop um, 
stop to compete with each other as fiercely as they did. And also, you know, like at the same time, the economy started to slow. People were looking at investments and actually suddenly companies needed to start making money. So they were cutting corners. So what happened is we had this complete dip. He argues that the strikes resulted in a transfer of wealth from union members and smaller streamers to Netflix. Galloway also believes that the gains made by the unions, for example, a 5% wage increase and the temporary AI protections were insignificant compared to the losses from being out of work for months. Um, I think we're talking about a 30-40% pay cut, like drop in payment compared to the prior year, which is insane. He suggests that there are now fewer writers making money post-strike with overall uh, buying and orders down. He also mentioned something very interesting. 80% of the members of SAG-AFTRA, the, the, the union for the actors, and he mentioned one very interesting fact that basically 80% of SAG-AFTRA members, the union for the actors, earn less than $25,000 a year, which means they don't have health insurance. So he calls it a vanity industry, an industry you only move into because of passion, but it's not something where, where it's easy to make money. You have the top 1% or top 10% making a lot of money, and then you have basically all the others barely, you know, barely making any money, which is insane. And of course, the current, like the way it's going, it's, it's only getting worse. He suggests... In general, also that there are fewer writers making money post strikes, and um, he argues that the unions should have partnered with the studios together, which I think is a very, very good point to fight against the big tech companies and AI rather than fighting each other. And I think that's the main point here. The funny thing is, you have the actors, you have the writers who were kind of fighting the studios and trying to get more money out of the studios, where you look at just basic numbers, like how many people are going to watch a movie these days? I saw some statistics somewhere, you know, like Forrest Gump had something like 45 million people in the US watch that movie in cinemas. Um, there is not even anything, anything that's even close to that. Like the successes of the Disney movies in the 90s or, you know, all those things that we are so far away from that. It's 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 shrunk so much. And I think it's something where people just don't want to face reality. And so they fight the studios, whereas actually none of the studios are actually, seems to be, suing OpenAI or suing Google or all those generative AI companies is what, what they probably should be doing. Because the New York Times is suing OpenAI, right? Um, there's a lot of newspapers who are, making deals with OpenAI. So they're actually getting money. They're getting millions and millions from them in order to enable them and allow them to use their uh, to use their uh, IP, their intellectual property. And we all know that they all trained these models on everything they could find on the internet. We talked about that one thing the other day on another episode where it was this interview with Mira Murati, one of the executives at OpenAI, where she really stumbled when she was asked about what the what 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 ChatGPT was trained on, where you could tell from her answer that basically we can assume that they did everything, like they, they used everything they could find on the open internet. And we've seen a lot of interviews with other executives from these companies where they basically said anything that's openly accessible, so as if as if anything that can be accessed publicly is is uh, open source, which it isn't, right? It's not. It's not. Um, it's not free to use for anybody without attribution um, and without payment. So, yeah, th it's it's crazy. It's crazy in a way, and that's his argument that the studios are not really suing those companies. They're trying to make deals with them, um, which is probably the a much worse deal than they could get if they would just lawyer up. And honestly, try to, you know, sue them <laughs> as much as they can uh, for what it's worth, because they can prove that they can definitely prove that the the data that they're using and the 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 images that they are generating is completely based on a lot of protected intellectual property that it's owned by them, and a lot of you know like cultural 
icons of Disney and whatever else that we know. Like, I mean, you, you just put in, you know, generate something that looks like, you know, Aladdin from Disney, you will get an image that looks almost exactly as it is from the movie. And um, so where else would it have the data from? So, yeah, he criticizes. So to summarize, yeah. to summarize what you just said, you simply have to choose whom you're making your war with, basically, and not spend all this energy to chase. I don't know what it, it's. It's. It's actually. I'm very curious to know why the studios are not chasing those big companies. Exactly. That's the. That's the question. You're like. Uh, you never know what's going on in the background. Is there big money, big tech money already involved and invested in these companies without us knowing? That could be easily the case. If you look at the market evaluations of those big tech companies these days, you know, s starting with NVIDIA and going down, and then you compare it to any of the studios, it's they're dwarfs in comparison, right? So it could easily be that some of the executives are heavily invested in tech as well, or even some of the companies are invested into those studios already. And we see it already kind of happening with the Paramount deal uh, that just happened. So as we said, like... <laughs> The, the son of Oracle, Oracle's founder, took over Paramount. So, yeah, he probably has good connections to the to Silicon Valley and, and all those people. The question is, would he be the right one to sue them, right? I mean, he's probably Oracle is not as involved with AI as other tech companies, but still, would he be the right person to sue, you know, uh, OpenAI or Google or Meta for that matter? So... I mean, interestingly, it's a bit of a bleak, bleak outlook, I would say, in in this podcast because Galloway also advises young people to be cautious about entering the entertainment industry, describing it, as I said before, as a vanity industry with instru structural decline, uh, if you look at the numbers. And he believes that the future of entertainment is completely already shifting towards smaller screens, whether we like it or not. For example... TikTok, YouTube, and away from traditional Hollywood productions and away from the big screen as well. So what's your take on this, Johnny? Would you, you know, like if, you're, if your son would say he wants to go into filmmaking, but maybe to be, you know, like a big time, let's say, director of feature films, would you still support him or would you tell him, look at what else is out there in terms of like storytelling for me personally, there's a very easy answer. I love movies, but I don't have the urge and I don't have the stamina to shoot them, meaning to shoot for Hollywood. Um, I don't think documentary is my thing. I don't think the documentary is going to be affected anytime soon. And I would advise to my son or my daughter, if they want to enter this business, it should be anything that deals with people. AI will not replace emotions. AI will not replace us as filmmakers dealing with other people. So I do believe that Hollywood might suffer in the short slash long run in some ways. I'm not there. And in all honesty, I also, as a rule of thumb, I decided not to be under pressure with all of this revolution. I'm listening carefully. I'm trying to study. I'm trying to learn what's happening exactly. I don't think that our job as documentary filmmakers or even wedding filmmakers will be touched anytime Yeah, but there's not just documentary really filmmakers. Those who are dealing with Hollywood. There's not just documentary filmmakers and wedding, but there's like have a million worry. others that probably have to worry more, right? Um, you can't just, you know, like, of course, on your personal perspective, but if you look at all the other industries, and I, thought, I don't think it's only AI. I mean, we've seen this trend before where um, I think with uh, COVID, we've probably seen that it it's kind of like the cinema experience, the theatrical experience has been, of course, completely out of the picture. It didn't exist for two years where you really couldn't go to the cinema for a long time. And then it, when it was back, I think a lot of people and especially the younger generation probably got used to not going to the cinema. And um, eventually the money, future money is in the internet. 
not in cinema, not in cinema per se. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, w but we have the streaming market also in decline now, in a way, right? Because it's it's difficult. It's it's a very very tough spot that people are in. I I I think I would advise somebody who's getting into the industry to really wholeheartedly embrace the new technology and also especially the new ways of distribution. I think those people who are doing really well now, and we already see this, is people who are really making great content for those new channels, whether it's new channels, yeah, whether it's YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, because we already see people who who are building huge audiences um, on those channels and now are getting kind of poached into doing more traditional things for the streamers or cinema. I think, I mean, we have Mr. Beast, who is the biggest YouTuber in the world uh, with billions of views on his videos. And now he's uh, developing a series, I think it's either for Netflix or Amazon Prime. And, uh, you, you know, like it's going the other way around. The, the whole thing is kind of flipping. So they're not taking, they're starting to take the talent from those, from those channels that, weren't taken seriously only a few years ago and whose suffering are probably the more traditional producers. So, and I already see it also in production companies. It's, it's uh, those who are not embracing social media and not embracing the new channels have a difficult, are in a difficult spot right now. So it's not as simple as it used to be, I think. Uh, it's, very, it's a lot more complex and there's a lot of things playing into that. Yeah, so, uh, but um, yeah, again, we really recommend people to listen to this podcast. It's just, a, it's good to get out of your bubble and hear the opinion of somebody who's, who's not from our industry and to paint a more realistic picture of where things are going and where things are headed. We'll be back after this message from our sponsor. Welcome to One Minute Tips brought to you by Fujifilm and Cine D. Today, I'm going to show you some new ways to use Fujifilm's custom setting slots for filmmaking. You may have thought that they are only ever useful for photo, but check this out. Let's say you're filming a live action scene and need to capture it in a high frame rate, but your camera is currently in 24 FPS. Now, you may go into the menu, find the menu item, and switch it there, but by that point, you might have missed your window of opportunity. Instead, program your frame rates to the custom setting slots, so that with a flick of a dial, you can go from 24 to 60 to 120 FPS, making sure you never miss a beat of the action. You can also program different file types or sizes to the custom setting slots so that, let's say if you ever need to save space on longer takes, you can switch from ProRes to H.265. Make sure to check back for more fun ways to use Fujifilm's custom settings. This has been One Minute Tips. Until next time. And now back to the show. Uh, let's stay with a similar topic actually for a second and move on to the Netflix of AI. We reported about a new platform that allows users to create custom episodes of their favorite series. Now, this is all still in prototype stage, but it's also something interesting that's happening. Um, it's a collaboration between, what is the company called? Fable. Well, actually, the company is called Fable and the project is called Showrunner. It's not open for the public yet, but they demonstrated last year, and I saw this here on their X channel, Twitter channel, whatever it's called now. Um, they basically created a South Park episode based on, you know, a prompt. And the funny thing is they immediately said, we used South Park for research only. We won't be releasing it because we don't use, we don't own the intellectual property of the episode, but they're still using it. So it's like the same thing, right? Uh, which is a bit weird, but they demonstrated this. So they put in all the different cast members in there. They defined the set, they defined the, um, the hero, and then they wrote a prompt about the story and then it automatically generated an animated episode of South Park. Now, of course, animation is a bit simpler to do, especially South Park, which is extremely simply animated, right? So I'm, I'm sure this is something that's much easier to do for those generative AI uh, tools. But still, it is a, it is something, something 
Yeah, the, the idea, first of all, they have only eight uh, different episodes, animation episodes uh, right now. And the thing is that they try to encourage people to record or do additional episodes. And if those will be nice, they might introduce them to the uh, original creators. You mean they have so eight different kind of series, not episodes? Like uh, uh, Series, yeah. sorry, you're right. Yeah. But it's kind of um, make your own animation. And yeah, I don't know. Again, it's a, with AI, maybe some people will like it at the beginning. But I really wonder how fast something like this will catch up. Yeah, so basically they're saying that you can put any idea into a, an actual series. It reminds me of the LTX studio thing, which we reported about too, which we now got like beta access. I played a little bit with it already, which is creating a full episode as well from text prompts. It's very rudimentary and it takes ages to render. Um, and of course the results, and that's the, the main thing with all those tools right now, is kind of random. I mean, it's still very random what you're getting. And, uh, but this is, this is an interesting development. Of course, I mean, these companies are getting a lot of money in their funding uh, because they will need most of the money actually for um, the server farms to render this stuff. Uh, we see this with a lot of different AI startups that basically most of the money goes into the actual processing that is required. Um, one scary thing that the CEO said, well, he was asked in an interview by the Hollywood Reporter, um, what was it trained on? And he said, again, on publicly available data, whatever that means, right? Publicly available to me, again, sounds like not something you own the IP for. It's just anything that you can find on the internet, which is, yeah, not right in a way. All right, so that's Fable's showrunner platform. Sorry? Uh, actually, we got an email today from Vimeo. You remember Vimeo in the happy days of, uh, <laughs> of course. filmmaking? So Vimeo now requiring people or creators to clearly state if they are using AI for their own creations. Well, that's like YouTube already does that. Yeah. Okay, well, the thing is, it's um, Meta actually had the same requirement, but they changed it a little bit. It used to say that you could tick generated with AI and then they changed it a little bit because of course sometimes not the whole thing is generated with AI but a part of it and then it it is like now it has a little mark which says it might be modified with AI or something but for them it's impossible to monitor this I mean they can't tell for sure um, it's a completely voluntary thing right now uh, not that they could let's prove. move on I mean personally I'm getting bored of this AI stuff in the in the sense of yeah well, it's a. Yeah, I think a lot of it. No, I tell you, I think a lot of it is really for the eyes of. Inv Sorry about the noise. I think a lot of it is for the eyes of investors. Yeah. Seems like those companies are craving for money, and in order to get the money, you need to keep the hype quite high. Yeah. So, it's 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 like a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Um, they show that there's a hype. Investors want to invest. Of course, we are reporting because it's a development or important development in our industry. But I don't know, Nino, do you think it's over-exaggerated in some ways? What Absolutely. Do you think? I mean, I think it's a complete, it's a huge bubble. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a significant development. AI is a significant development and especially generative AI, but it's a huge bubble. I mean, there is no way that NVIDIA is worth more than Apple and Microsoft, you know. It's like a chip manufacturer that doesn't even own a chip manufacturing plant. There is a huge bubble around this, whether we like it or not, but everybody's blind now because a lot of people put their money on this and they just want it to be real. And I, I'm not saying that it's not relevant. It's very relevant and it's going to change a lot of things in any industry. But I think the same thing that happened in 2000 with the original internet bubble will happen now. You know, the bubble will burst. A lot of people will cry because they lost a lot of money in the stock market and investing in these companies. But then the actual useful stuff will come out of it. And the more reasonable approach will come to the whole thing. But it will take some time. And that's, you know, like the, the only question is, and that's the problem with any bubble, we don't know when it will burst. 
I think it's already quite a big bubble, but it could burst tomorrow, but it might only burst in two years from now. And, and we are not the one to advise people if to invest or not. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it is definitely a bubble and it will burst. The only question is when, but that doesn't mean that the AI technology or generative AI technology is something that we should be ignored. It will be significant, but I agree with you. I don't think we have seen any of those, any significant application, especially in the uh, video generation aspect of it yet, but it's it's going to come. All right. Uh, well, I promise this is the last AI topic, but I just grouped them together. We also had, a, we reported on the first generative AI camera, now that is very interesting. It's a it's a a project by a company called Special Guest X and First Ave Machine. Now, as you might have noticed, none of them are any traditional camera manufacturers, um, and it's a little bit of a hint regarding the product. So, what is this camera? It's called the CMR M1. It looks like a very very vintage box almost like something from 100 years ago like one of the original film cameras a very boxy design with a huge dial on the side and a very you know like small lens in front we had we get no information about a lot of the tech specs regarding the sensor we only know that it can only shoot it can only shoot 12 frames per second in in 1368 by 768 pixels so very low res it's not even like 12 frames per second is nothing, of course, not feasible for actual movie recording. And we get no information regarding ISO, dynamic range or color depth or any of that. Any of that. But what it does is it's somehow connected to the cloud as every, anything needs to be right now. And um, it is generating, it's kind of regenerating the images that you're shooting and making kind of animations out of it. So you can, for example, film in the demo video, they show, um, you know, like they film skateboarders and then they are turned into a flower field and suddenly a very, it looks like animation suddenly. I mean, a very nice look, I have to say. And it's almost like applying an extreme filter on your footage, like a, like a lot that doesn't only affect the look of the image, it also replaces parts of the image with um, you know artificially generated additional stuff and apparently they are planning to do because it's a prototype it's not a out to use yet I think probably it doesn't even work yet probably it's something like you said probably they're just looking for money um, from investors to make this a reality but they are showing like little chip cards that you put into the camera where is it here so you 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 put those cards inside the camera and then you have a different look or you make it look like you know like a starry sky or you make it look like a flower field and this well this doesn't happen in camera so it it somehow has to connect to the internet which means there will be a significant delay i can't see this being useful if you have it in camera but it doesn't do it in real time i mean in the demo video they show it changing in real time, but in the press text, it actually says it needs to connect. So I can't see this happening in real time. So I'm sure this is not an actual an actual demonstration what we see in this video yet. Uh, with this little dial, you can dial in and out of the effect more or less. Um, now, we've seen Apple Intelligence introduced for the at the WWDC a couple of weeks ago where there is more on device uh, generative AI happening than with other manufacturers uh, but we're mostly talking about text generation a little bit of image generation I can only th see this being successful if it could happen on device but I don't see how this is possible right now and in my opinion I mean, I don't need it to make random creative effects onto my footage, right? Uh, we've seen, I mean, a lot of people will know the Lightroom effect the, uh, that is actually defining a depth map. So in, a, in, in one of the most recent versions of Lightroom, if you are editing a photo, you can create artificially 
artificial shallow depth of field. So for example, if you shoot something with an f4 lens and you think you need more background blurriness, you know, you basically it it recognizes what's in focus and it can make everything in the back even less in focus and it works perfectly. I use this a lot for our featured images from NAB actually because you know, usually we shoot with a maximum of two f two point eight lens, and it's very difficult to make featured images of these trade shows. So I I increased it to mimic a one point two lens, and it just was more out of focus. So that's amazing. But having that technology inside the camera would be great. Imagine having a a standard kit lens on your camera or a very small sensor, and then having this fake shallow depth of field in camera, on your footage, in real time, that would be a real benefit for AI without actually kind of reinventing everything. Sounds like what Apple is doing with the iPhone 15 Pro. Exactly. But we need it in normal cameras, right? We want all this functionality in normal cameras. And that's that for me would be a very creative addition of um, generative AI, whatever you call it, because it is something that's artificial intelligence machine learning that's what really what it is and there's a lot of different ways i mean we've talked about this before right we don't none of the traditional camera manufacturers has any way to properly process footage on device or photos you always need to send it somewhere else and i think that's where they're really lacking especially in comparison with smartphones but i mean those are the things that would make our lives easier that would be a reason to buy a new camera honestly you know like if you had a if you had only that function, it's just that shallow depth of field thing in, let's say, in a new, whatever, GH8 from Panasonic. I'm just saying this because I'm looking at a Panasonic camera here. Um, could be any other manufacturer. But if you had this function, you know, that would be a reason to upgrade for me. What do you think? While you're talking about this, I'm thinking, you know, like a camera, one single lens, and this feature that you talked about. And that con this is connecting me to, I think it was a year ago, I was in a meeting with one of the manufacturers, camera manufacturers here in Japan, and they had to submit ideas for s things that they can develop in about five years from now. And we were kind of joking how, how much into the future can you predict our industry? So it's the same about recording directly to the cloud. If you remember, um, and and this is not a, this is not a secret, on many of the camera manufacturers' roadmap, there is no slot for memory card because within whatever number of years you will record directly to the cloud. So things like this, which is a little bit hard for us to imagine now will materialize into something which is very much doable in the very near future. And probably what you're suggesting now, I will not be surprised if any of the manufacturers is already developing something like this. It's just that the, the power, the pro processing power that is required is probably quite high. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, if we have the processing power like that in a smartphone, it should be possible to buy that Qualcomm chip or whatever it is and put it into a camera. And because we have it, in, we have it on phones. I think the bigger the sensor is, uh, the higher risk for overheating inside. It's always a chain reaction. Yeah, for video, of course, it's difficult. But, but for photo, for, for video, yeah, for videos. But um, I think in 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 the very near future, we will be able to to see new technologies for um, uh, control overheating in cameras and other devices too. Uh, there is already an American company that's doing uh, quite nice things and, and it's a completely different thinking of how to uh, dispense he uh, heat, heat within, within um, components and I'm sure we're gonna hear more about this. So if you solve overheating, obviously you can do more with the processing. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we've seen a lot of you know, in the past few years, we've talked about it a lot. New lenses have been, well, vintage lenses have been very popular because people want to kind of bake into bake an, a nice look into their digital footage, right? So basically, us shooters, 
want to generate an image that's already nice looking when we hand it over to whoever is working with it, whether it's ourselves or somebody else. And very often it's out of the control of the shooter, which is why it's nice to use vintage looking lenses um, in order to generate a, you know, a unique look. I mean, that's, we all know that, right? Especially it's not only in commercials, it's in, it's in feature films, documentaries everywhere. Everybody wants a unique look and, 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 and most people resort to lenses because the cameras, of course, deliver perfect images I mean, we we know the we have picture profiles and stuff, and now we have these uh, what is it called on the RE Alexa thirty five, the it's not picture profiles, it's kind of no. I mean the I forgot I lost uh, it's they don't call it the picture profile, but essentially it's giving you a different which company now? RE RE yeah they they introduced with the Alexa thirty five this kind of look thing which is not called look you know uh, I'm sure one of our readers will comment on that <laughs> it's Ari, Ari look fine That's no, no i don't mean that it's like mm. uh anyway it was introduced with the alexa 35 and it's kind of like a pro picture profile but it's more like giving you a different look of different almost film stocks and um it's kind of baked into the footage even if it's log anyway yeah yeah and uh but so basically manufacturers are trying to give the shooters more opportunity to generate different look and imagine just having what's happening not yet right now is all those functions that we have on a smartphone to basically generate what is hardware wise an inferior image right because it's a small sensor it's it needs to be enhanced there is noise reduction there is all this and then we have this fake shadow depth of field and all this to make it look nicer than it is if you have that same technology applied to an image that's already much better because it comes from a bigger sensor because it comes from you know, like a proper proper camera with interchangeable lenses, the the first manufacturer that solves this in a nice way will be very successful, in my opinion, and um, will sell a lot of those cameras. So, uh, yeah, even... I mean, we've seen these experiments in the past where I think we had Samsung and Zeiss both had cameras that had Android as an operating system, right? Uh, they both failed. Uh, at least they were discontinued. I think it was called a ZX1 or something from Zeiss. And then we had another camera years before from Samsung, which had the same or similar approach. And they both were discontinued. Um, I wonder why that is. But just having Lightroom on your camera, even if it's just for photography, would be amazing, right? So anyway, I still think this is a big thing. And this is, of course, a much more basic thing than this generative AI com uh, camera that is really just a concept right now. Um, but it's it's something that would be very useful. All right, moving on. Now, finally, we're done with AI for this episode. Uh, let's move on to the Iodine Creator Series. So Iodine, a storage manufacturer and networked storage manufacturer, uh, started to release a new series of... Um, little very nice short films about creatives showcasing what they work on and it's not really they're not really pushing their product to be honest um what, what can you tell me about this johnny so first of all just a little bit about the company because it's an american company and they are specializing in storage solutions that they are specifically created for film um, film makers uh, we reviewed the main product this is the uh, um, pro data it's in the size of uh, what a 15 inch macbook pro and it's very fast and it's really nice how you can work with this connect different devices and this like an, a nice hub and it's it's i think in hollywood they're using quite a lot the main obstacle of that specific device is of course the price i mean i'm not so sure that this is something for independent filmmakers who, um, who, are, who are on the budget, let me say. Otherwise, it can be uh, also a run and gun solution. But in this, uh, I think in general, what Iodine is trying to do is give you a peace of mind because we know, we all know how it is when you're recording, when you're backing up, when you're editing, there's always a concern did I do this right? Is it working? Uh, did I lose some files? And so on. So 
uh, uh, what they're trying really to do is to bring us to a place that we know that we can trust the equipment. And this is quite interesting approach. Part of it is this new series that you just talked about. And, and, and again, the way that they are promoting it, I think it's quite smart. It's really a glimpse into the way that the artist thinks. Because we, we all of us, we all we have our own way uh, for pre-production, for the production, for the filming, for the editing. So obviously they are trying to kind of enter our minds or interview and create those shorts episodes i think it's a one minute episode yeah uh, so a, that also fits half, very two well two and a half minutes yeah so sorry two and a half minutes yeah so they released already two episodes one of them with sam nicholson is a aac uh he has his own company and he's also a, i mean he's a dop a cinematographer and he has also a, a vfx uh, supervisor uh within his company and so on and different projects and the, the the second episode is with Gerger apparently he's an Austrian photographer I'm not in this scene so I'm, I never heard of him um, but I think it's really worth looking at those episodes and see first of all from the marketing perspective it's nice to see how iodine is promoting their own product without even mentioning it once and the second thing is um, just to see how others are working and how others, how they need different components for their work in order to have this peace of mind. Yeah, absolutely. I was just impressed. I, I watched the first episode with uh, um, Sam Nicholson and uh, it's a look into his way of working as a, in virtual production. I mean, he's somebody who worked for 40 years almost in the industry and he's not a new kid on the blog, but he's working with these very new technologies and he's talking about the storage needs of virtual productions and how they're changing everything. It's just, yeah, like you said, it's a very neat look. It doesn't look like a commercial and it's really like a very personal glimpse into their way of working, which I think w why it's really worth watching. It's almost like uh, It's almost like our factory tours that you're shooting. It's a really nice tap into the brain of an artist. All right, um, so moving on to more traditional news, we had an announcement from O'Connor. O'Connor being a very traditional manufacturer of tripods and tripod heads, especially for big setups and very expensive uh, setups. They introduced... Yeah, and the company was founded in 1949. This is what, 75 years ago? That's crazy. Yeah, it's an American company that of course, like most tripod manufacturers in the West is now owned by the Videndum Group, but um, they're still working pre predominantly targeting their products at very high-end productions and their reputation is very good for having very, very, well, I would say um, gentle fluid heads that allow for perfect balancing and perfect panning and tilting even with the heaviest of the heavy setups, you know, like if you put a huge duvo lens or whatever, a huge telephoto lens on this, you are still able to balance it properly. They introduced a new head called the Ultimate 2575E Platinum Edition Fluid Head. And... Um, 20,805 US dollars. Yeah, it's something you can't buy from the change in your pocket for sure. And this is not for DSLR or mirrorless camera. No. And I think well, in some of the comments... <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Like we had a, the comments were interesting. We had like, what? People are crazy. How can this be that expensive? But somebody, one of our uh, more uh, regular commenters, Steve Oakley commented what the point is of having a head like this and why it's not for the average user. And it's also really not for... You know, like, I mean, we put the price just for the giggles. It's not that anybody actually will buy this from our website because this is definitely a rental item. Usually rental houses will buy this and a good tripod, and I've said this a million times, will last you your full career. I mean, uh, the, the first proper tripod I bought was like 17 years ago. I still use it on every shoot. Um, it's... It's not 20,000 though, it was like 7,000, but still, uh, good tripods and especially tripod heads are expensive 
And um, yeah, I think in, in a certain uh, segment of our industry, the O'Connor tribals are very much um, the standout. Yeah, they're like as you said, if you, if you have a, they're like the Mercedes. If you have a heavy s- the Mercedes right. workhorse. If you have a heavy setup, like uh, big lenses and so on. Um, I don't know. You want to use the Fuji non duvo lens on on a uh, on a camera, and you're shooting some nature, and you, you can't afford that. Uh, the wind or any little movement will 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 shake the the camera. You probably will use that that specific uh, company for the job. And we all know what you use, what you need a proper fluid head for, and that goes for amera, any camera, si- any size of camera setup. It's especially those sm- small, subtle movements that are very difficult to achieve if you don't have a proper fluid head, um, because especially when you start your pan or tilt. Uh, can be very, very difficult. I see a lot of people starting out when I teach that don't have a proper tripod head and they always wonder why they can't do proper pans. And it's like, it's horrible if you see somebody doing a pan and then the first movement is this little bit of a jump. Horrible. And same... I solved the problem. Don't pan? I just find a nice frame (laughs) and I go for it. I simply don't move the camera. (laughs) Yeah. Good luck with that, filming nature. Good. Um... We had a new new kit on the block announcing a series of cinema primes. Uh, the company is called Krypton Ore. Uh, Johnny, what can you tell me about these guys? Actually, not much because I didn't really do my homework. I was on vacation, finally. <laughs> with okay, the I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. When this came out. So please, Nino. Yeah, so I also, you know, like, I mean, it's not super familiar with this, but basically... Um, this is a collaboration um, between America and Italy, actually. And a company, the Krypton Ore, was founded by director cinematographer Franco Campo Lopez Ben Yunes. I hope I say this name right. And it's a collaboration with White Point Optics out of Finland. So basically, his curiosity and enthusiasm for vintage lenses led him to venture into this project. And uh, these guys from Finland gave the technical support, precision and expertise uh, that's needed from, you know, somebody who's been working with uh, optics for a very long time. So basically, those are optics that are, let me get this right, donor optics dating back to the mid-70s to the late 80s. And they were rehoused. It's not a traditional rehousing approach. Um to prioritize consistency across the set. They were trying to focus on the unique qualities of the lenses that this cinematography loves, uh, especially the modern versions of the Konica, Hexagon, AR and Pentax M uh, SMC lenses. They mixed and matched attributes across those lenses and then changed the iris blades. Um, so that is unified. I think they have now 16 blades and uh, improved the close focus and then created a one-of-a-kind set. Now, it's funny that for me, I don't even know how they can make a uh, kind of mass production with this. I mean, he says they don't want to do mass production, but in uh, what does that mean? I mean, like, uh, is there only one set or can more than how many sets are they able to make? And are those sets going to be different compared to each other? I don't know. I mean... Uh, the list, they have now nine focal lengths, 21, 28, 35, 40, 50s, 57, 85, 100, and 135 millimeters. A very neat set, which is a very, I think the gaps in between those focal uh, focal lengths are very good. I mean, they're very consistent. There's not a huge, there's not a single huge gap that you can make out. Maybe a 45 is missing, but it's very good. Um, and yeah, most of them are... The f-stop varies, the t-stop varies between t1.3 and t2.9 for the longer ones. What do you want to say? No, I mean, what I want to say is actually when I, when I see there are some stills taken from uh, from images uh, that were captured with those lenses, they look they look very nice. Actually, in some ways, it's reminding anamorphic look <laughs> without being anamorphic lenses. Um, it almost looks yeah, like tilt shift very... in this example, right? I mean, maybe she's 
it looks like a almost like a like a tilt shift thing because you see it's funny like it's only only a part of of a focal plane is in focus but that might be the vintage yeah look and, and of course some promised filter to soften the image was also used yeah so they look very nice housing is nice um i don't know it's uh yeah very bloomy highlights maybe that's because of a filter i don't know honestly the, the, i'm sure it's because it of doesn't say to, though to, why would to, you show this with a filter yeah yeah i will i'm sure there's some promised filter yeah black or white i mean in order to enhance this um, it says official launch softness. will be in september 24 so maybe we'll see them at ibc i don't know i hope so maybe we can see them in the flesh there uh you can you know like you can read the article on our website we have links to their instagram account and web and their website to keep um up to date with it uh, it looks impressive. It's it, uh, there's no pricing yet. Um, they say that the turnaround will be around six months once you order, which is not bad for something like that. Especially if you compare it to, um, you know, the Ukrainian lenses uh, that Graham reviewed. The huh? Our oh, iron glass, iron glass. Thank you, Felix. Uh, our brains. Where are they? All right. All right, that's the core OR lenses. Let's move on to another piece of news, which is um, very interesting. Matthews uh, released a, it's called the Middle Max Menace Boom Arm. Now, this is, again, something not for the indie filmmaker, but something that goes into a grip truck or a lighting truck. And it looks like a really, really cool way of having a very long boom where you can you know, hang a heavy light or something like that without actually needing that much space because all the weights are at the base of that device. Um, it, it comes with wheels. Uh, you have all the counterweights on top of the wheels. You don't need any, any additional space on the other side uh, to kind of balance the whole thing. And... Uh, yeah, just a very... Think of it as a foldable boom, basically. Yeah, it's a foldable boom on wheels and it goes in the grip truck and it's very small in the in the grip car. It's it's very smart. I think I can see this used on a lot of sets um, because we always run into the problem that you don't want to see light stands and if you have a tracking shot or something like that, you can't use any stands. You need to hang the lights. If there's nothing you can hang the lights on you need something like this and it can be very very complicated setups so yeah matthews is always good with those grip solutions they're really leading in this way and uh, yeah the middle max M matthews middle max menace <laughs> it's like a tongue breaker um looks like a very very good solution all right um pricing availability again this is i guess not something for the indie filmmaker this is definitely something for a rental house and i can see this very being very popular uh it's going to be six thousand dollars yeah what do you want to say no we're talking about booms or stabilizer or whatever i think we can easily move into the KMTV pocket 3 multifunctional shock observer arm yes what well, can you tell released. me about it first of all i'm quite amazed that it's becoming um it's it's kind of very much in right now to produce something like this. Car mounts, you mean? Um, ca yeah, but car mounts. Well, let me just check. I want to see which company. Yeah, we talked about one the other the other day actually, which released something actually, similar. We talked about. That's right. We talked about two of those. We talked about where is this? Just want to make sure that I'm not making any mistake. Um, well, Tilta, of course, or oh, the Muff Max, you mean? Muff Max. That's the right. MoffMax blade the arm, one. exactly. It's also a very inexpensive thing that, I mean, both the uh, yeah, same price, actually. The Came TV is $149 and the MoffMax for the DJI Pocket 3 also. Same price. So it's going to be interesting to compare those two, actually. Um, That's true. But I also want to say, because, I mean, it's not not a secret that B&H is one of our uh, side sponsors when it comes to affiliate. Uh, we could see how much when we reported about news about the Movcom, how Movmax. how many of uh, for, thank you, uh, how many of those were actually uh, bought? Yeah, 
insane amount of uh, quantity. I was very surprised, but obviously people are looking for such a solution. And I mentioned before my vacation, I was running mostly this time with the DJI Osmo Pocket 3. Simply amazing piece of camera device, perfect for families. Uh, if you don't want to be a big director when you shoot your uh, kids, um, when you're on vacation and you do don't want to risk your connection and contact with your wife, this is the, <laughs> this is a perfect camera. It's on the gimbal and just 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 go with it. Yeah. So the combination of those um, absorber, uh, shock observer arms, arms and and the DJI, I'm sure it's very nice. Well, also, and I, I think we mentioned it before with the Mouth Max, uh, also for the Cam TV Pocket Three shock arm. Um, it's basically, I think people start realizing that you don't, don't really need a big camera. And when I see, say big, I even mean a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. Um, you don't need a camera like that on your car hood, right? Because those cameras like the Pocket 3 are now good enough to actually intercut uh, with, with bigger cameras. And usually you have very deep focus anyway on those shots. You don't need a shallow depth of field. You need a cool angle of your car, either of the wheel moving or of the windshield and the people behind it, which is usually a wide angle. And wide angles don't really have the shallow depth of field in most cases anyway. So that's, yeah, it's absolutely, it's becoming something, I mean, $150, it's like a, you know, it's like the, it's like the DJI mini drones. It's like something you throw into your pocket, you have it with you on a shoot, and if the if the challenge arises that you have to shoot um, a character driving a car, you just have it with you. And and it's enough to have one or two shots from that device and that's it. Your production value is already elevated yeah. and that looks great. Like with a drone, exactly. All right, thank you, Johnny. I think we can wrap it up here. Uh, unless there's anything else you want to talk about. Any AI topic no, that you I came up to... with while we were talking? That <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's what? It's 7 p.m. here in Tokyo, actually in Osaka, sorry. Um, and um, yeah, time to go to eat dinner and leave you guys to produce even more content. Thank you. Joking. Thank you, Johnny. We'll talk again <laughs> next week, probably. And thanks everybody for watching. Of course, please like and subscribe to our Focus Check podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. We really appreciate if you could give us a good rating there. We're still kind of new to the podcasting space, but hey, it's the 20th episode, so we're kind of getting the hang of it. Thank you, guys, and see you next week.